Um, good evening, everybody. Um, welcome to this Wood Solutions Seminar on timber in lining and cladding. And I apologise for the cup of tea that isn't here, sort of the, sh the shroning as cup, cup of tea. Um, <laughs> these new buildings, you can never trust them, can you? Okay, so we've sent out, we're trying to see if we can find a kettle. So we might have a cup of tea later on, or there might be a cold cup of tea. All right, so um, this seminar is being recorded. Is that too loud, or is that, that all right? It's good. Okay, I'm just going to do the feedback here. Is that still okay? Yep. So this seminar is being recorded, and I'll take the recording, and in about two or three days' time, it'll be on the Seesaw website. So if there's people who couldn't make it, and you know you, you find this this performance so attractive that you've got to share it with your friends, then it will be available on um, the Seesaw site with the seminar we gave last time and with Christoph's seminar from earlier in the year. So all of those are available. Okay, I've just got to work out what machine I'm running on. Okay. So there's a whole lot of things I'm not going to touch tonight. And that's because... There's a range of there's a range of guides that are going to cover a, a lot of the technical information that are going to back up some of the things I'm going to talk about. So if we look at these, um, cladding in bushfire prone areas has particular constraints in it, depending on what your bushfire attack level is. And while I will say that that is the case, that we're not necessarily going to cover any of that, and it's all covered in design guide number four which goes through the, all the requirements for design with wood in bushfire prone areas. So that one's there already. The next one is the Timber Service Life Design Guide. Now that's actually comes from work that was done about 2009, 2010, 2011. There's actually a piece of software you can download off the web with, that goes with that one. Um, it's a pretty well kept secret, but I've got a copy that I use. So the design guide is a result of a, quite a large project which looked at trying to set up an engineering basis for design with timber externally. So it covers um, design of fixings, design of decking, et cetera, a whole range of different applications. And you can specify the area that you work in and it will then give you an estimated life of particular components of the building, depending upon the species of timber you use, its, its durability classes, the treatments you use, etc. So it's actually a very powerful little um, guide, and the software is then also useful because it automates some of that process for you. And you can run scenarios with it. It's something that Wood Solutions has not promoted very much, and I've, or, I've never actually understood why, but the software is available off the site, but it'll only run on a PC. So they don't have a Mac version. But that will give you, particularly useful as the recommendations for fixings and when you actually need fixings of particular, particular grades and the expected life you're likely to get from particular grades, depending on how close you are to the sea or industrial areas or a range of other things. Okay, so that's that one. The next one's finishing timber externally, and that covers some of the things that we're going to talk about tonight. It talks about um, detailing, it talks about coating systems, again, durability of species. And it really resulted, it was done about five years ago. Um, so John Shanks, who used to work with me, and I wrote that one. And it covers the different coating systems and how long they're likely to last. And while I might mention that tonight, I'm not going to put the tables up and bore everybody because it's the middle of winter, it's Thursday night and all that sort of stuff. So I'm going to say that that's in there and you can find them in the, in the guides. Um, the next one is timber and internal design and timber and internal design also goes through a whole lot of the products that are available, the species characteristics, the colour variation you're likely to get ways in which you can specify detailing arrangements, etc., and also deals with different types of coatings and gives you a whole range of, e of examples. 
So all of these are going to cover most of what I'm going to talk about, but I've added some new things in because there is a range of new treatments and systems and also new projects that people are doing internationally which I think show us some interesting ideas. Okay, so what we'll do tonight is we'll, we'll have a first part. It'll go for about 40 minutes. Um, we'll, we'll go out there and have a cup of, cup of cold water um, and have a chat and then we'll have um, part two um, where I'll deal with cladding and that'll be slightly more technical than the first part. Um, a couple of things, if this is your first seminar or if you came in and there's a registration sheet outside, so if you haven't signed in, could you please just initial your name if you've registered? If you haven't registered, just write your name down. And um, that lets us know how many people have attended and, and what you've done. Um, the facilities, for those who've never been in this building before, the toilets are just past this first screen and on your right-hand side. And there's obviously chilled water further down and biscuits and, and cold coffee. Okay, so, so definitions. Um, lining is inside or sheltered. And cladding is outside and it's exposed to the weather. And that makes two really different conditions for um, what we're likely to do. There is probably one other major aspect of that is that lining is inside and we might bump into it a lot. We wear it a lot. Um, cladding is outside and we don't generally go around and rub ourselves against the, the, the cladding. So we will look at performance requirements later on. So here's, um, I've got a series of jobs. Um, for those of you who might have come to the Tasmanian Timber Seminar uh, a couple of weeks ago, some of the jobs will be the same, but a lot of them aren't. So this is a, a job in uh, Noosa. And in this one, we've obviously got an external application, which is, which is a cladding application. It's outside, it's exposed to the weather, and that's all done in black butt. Um, black butt comes from that part of the world too, so there's a lot of acceptance for that species. Oh, sorry. If we look inside, up here, we see we've got all this material inside, and that's all lining material, and this is all Taz oak, and it's been coloured. So there's been stains applied to it to make a particular colour palette. Here's a, a winery in Dakota, uh, Daytona in the US. And here we've got obviously a range of cladding, timber cladding systems that have been put on that are, that are coloured also. And yet we have then this very strong lining that's gone on with very, very strong diagonals in the, um, the patterning. And that patterning and the diagonals continue because they've actually carried their diagonals across skylights that are both outside and inside. Um, we would notice that this bit's obviously lining because it's inside, it's not going to be exposed to the weather, it's too far underneath the roof. But this bit over here is actually going to be exposed to the weather. So if we were designing that bit and that bit over there, we're going to have to expect differences in performance over time. This is a, a really lovely library building in Norway. Um, here we can see, obviously, we've got a whole range of timber cladding. It's sawn boards. We've got these large blades that are used, obviously, to... to control the sunlight coming into the windows that are above, and also to give this glow when it's darkened up and you've got the lights from inside. Inside, you've then got this absolutely superb use of glue lamb ribs and in pairs, and then in between the pairs in the large distance, you then have timber lining boards that form this curved ceiling down so here we can see the lining boards running through. They're in their boards, their pairs apart, with a black material in behind. And in between the pairs of glue lamb, we've got lights positioned 
and then in the upper areas there's actually skylight in between them. So you get this really lovely combination of the curve then that forms down in to make the bookshelves and the reading nooks then that um, we want to get people to sit in and make quite personable spaces with. So the, the timber gives you a really nice tone, it's quite relaxing, it gives you a nice sound absorption and you get this really nice combination of, of shapes. Now there is a couple of Australian examples I've got to put up of, with, that exploit similar things, lots of timber blades um, forming quite complex shapes through, through the buildings, but this is a really nice new one. Okay, so if we look at cladding, obviously the cladding's the outside components that we, we could look at in each of those projects, and the linings and the inside ones, which gives us a range of different architectural um, options. Performance requirements are things that come with the application. So whatever our solution is going to be, we're going to have to solve a particular the, the thing. The solution's got to do a range of particular jobs, and no matter what we select, they still have to satisfy those jobs. So our basic performance requirements are going to be strength, fire resistance, durability, stability. Uh, visual appeal, and indentation resistance. And if we look at the difference between cladding and lining, these performance requirements will apply, but they're going to apply with different accents depending upon what the project is. So with both lining and cladding, strength is not a major consideration. We don't walk on it. If we bump it, it's generally occasional. Um, it doesn't have to carry a lot of load, and so our strength characteristics are relatively minor. Fire resistance varies between a lining and a cladding, and it varies particularly with application. So if we're talking about a house in a suburb, then fire resistance is not an issue in either cladding or lining. But if we're talking about a public building like this one, and we've got a public space like the one out there, then there's particular fire indices that we need from the materials that we use in that condition. And so we can only use certain species in that condition, those locations, if we can use it at all. So as we go through, I think it's um, BCA specification C110, that sets out the fire indices required in public corridors and, and circulation spaces and paths of egress and that will establish fire indices that are required from flooring, lining, ceiling materials. So that's going to influence what we're going to use as a lining material in wood in those, those locations. It's interestingly, I was, went into a meeting the other day at a building around the corner where the Forest Industries Association is, and in the corridor outside their office, the walls are lined, the, 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 the lifts are lined with wood, but it's all black butt from New South Wales. Because the local timbers do not meet the fire indices for those locations. But the, the, the denser New South Wales ones do. And so they were saying, we've got to work out a way we can get our species in these spots. So that's something we, we, we hope to be looking at soon. But that's what, what that ties up there. And the cladding, that obviously deals in bushfire prone areas because species fire resistance ties to density and generally density. And so the denser the timber, the more fire um, prone location you can put it in. So that's obviously a consideration for us. Durability is not that much of an issue inside unless we're inside a sauna or some other form of sweaty location, but it's certainly going to be a condition outside. And there are lots of factors about durability we could discuss. Um, we could discuss mould, we can discuss weathering, we can discuss decay. And at the end of the second part, I'll actually show you some examples of things you really don't want, you wouldn't want to see in your project, but obviously they're in somebody's project, so it's something we've got to learn from. Stability is the next. 
is that we want material that's stable when we put it in place and doesn't distort because of conditions. Um, again, I'll show you a location where that's been a problem. If you mess up a basic rule, that will be a problem. So visual appeal is something which you can pick. And indentation resistance is something we're often concerned, we're occasionally concerned about inside. But it's often where you know you're going to have people run around with bags. Bags, shopping carts, luggage, in a house with dogs, those sorts of things. Um, a lot of tourist facilities, you'll actually see, go into a new tourist facility, it'll all be gorgeous and then you'll see the timber lining in a particular part of the foyer has got all these bang marks in it from where people have run into them with their bags, which is not a good look. Okay, so a material then has material characteristics that satisfy the performance requirements. So we can look up the strength, the fire resistance, the durability, the not so much the stability of the species. Um, one key one we've got to make sure of is moisture content. And while I've covered this in a number of seminars, I'm, I'm, most of the problems that we get when people ring us up with pro about a problem with, with buildings, with wood in buildings, half the time it's moisture content related issues. So I don't mind doing it again. So strength is something you can look up in one of the guides. Fire resistance is in the guides also. Durability is in the guides. I could show you processes, but it's, in, it's basically in the guides. Stability comes down to the, relation, the ratio of the width of the board, the thickness of the board, and how regularly you fix it. Generally, if you have a wide board that's very thin and it's not fixed very regularly, it will distort. So I will show you a photograph of a project later on where you've got a wide board, it's been put outside, they've secret fixed it, and they're, so they've secret fixed it basically in a board that wide. It's got secret fixings down one side, and then it's quite a, quite a thin vertical cladding material, and it hasn't sat still. It's wobbled quite a lot and quite quickly. So those sorts of things we, we've, got to, we've got to recognize and handle. Visual appeal is something we can select, so moisture content. Okay, so um, apologies to those who have heard this bit before. But when we use wood, wood's a hygroscopic material, so it absorbs and gives out moisture to be in equilibrium with its surrounding environment. So in a condition like in here, there'll be a moisture content of wood generally about 10 to 11%. So that'll be normal. Um, with the moisture content of the wood changes, then moisture moves into the cell walls of the wood and they get bigger. And as they get bigger, the whole piece gets bigger marginally. So as more water moves in, it gets bigger some more. As the water goes out, it gets smaller. Now all of these ratios are known, we, there's been, they've been just known from tests, and that happens, shrinkage happens in three different ways. One's longitudinal, tudinal, that's along the grain. One's tangential, that's around the growth rings. And one's radial, across the growth rings. So if we take a bit of one of the species that's in Taz Oak, that's this one here, and we dry it from 35% moisture content down to 12, it will shrink around the tangential direction about 13%. So if I want to end up with a 100 millimetre board after it's dried and it's perfectly back sawn, like the growth rings are running straight across the 100 mil, I've got to cut it at 115. And if I'm lucky, it will stop at 102. If I cut it and it's a, a, a quarter sawn board so that we've got growth rings, the growth rings running along the wide direction, if I want it, if I want it 35 mil at the end, 
I've got to actually cut it at 50. And it will shrink down. Oh no, if I cut it at 50, it's going to shrink down to about 43 when I'm finished. Okay, now that's nothing to do with distortion. It's all to do with moisture content loss. And that's normal. So, but your miller handles that. What you've got to handle as designers is the way in which you arrange the timber relative to each other, knowing that this is going to occur. So if we look at what this means in terms of absolute terms, let's look at two floorboards. This isn't a flooring talk, but you know the floorboard's going to move. This. If I clad that wall with lining, the same figures will apply. So if I take an 85 millimeter board in Taz Oak or an 85 millimeter board in Blackbutt, one's cortisone, uh, sorry, cortisone's this one, growth wings this way, backsone's that one, cortis growth wings running the long direction. And I manufacture it at 12% moisture content, I mill it at that, that'll be the size. If I put it in a room with 9%, which is effectively this room with a lot of heating, then each board of the Taz Oak is going to shrink 6.6 millimetres. And we know that's going to happen. So if I have lots of boards and I stick them all together, then if they can't move, because I put them in a tabletop and I, I do something silly and I fix them really solidly at each end, then they're still going to move. But they're going to break something on the way. That's what's likely to happen. The same with a black button, it was going to do it even more. If I take a table or a bit of joinery like this, if I made this out of boards and I fix the boards to a piece of timber running this way at that end and that end and I put lots of epoxy, lots of not epoxy, polyurethane finish over it so it all sticks together, this board will not shrink this way as with changes in moisture content, but these ones will. So as they shrink and they're constrained with this one, they're going to split. Now, if you don't believe me, that's fine. Go over to, what's it called? There's a little cafe over here in Salamanca, um, in the Salamanca Art Centre, and their tables are made with boards that run this way, with an end board like that, and they've fixed it. And all the boards in the middle have all got great big gaps in them. So if you design joinery, fixing or lining so that this is a detail, then you're likely to have a problem. Okay, so we've got particular moisture content set in the standards. Um, so for furniture and parquet, we've got a particular from 9 to 13. For flooring, 9 to 14. For um, cladding, 10 to 18. Now this is what the producer can supply to you and comply with the standard. In Tassie, they tend, the producers will be aiming for 10 to 11 with anything they're going to provide for an internal application because that's the equilibrium moisture content of most of our buildings on average. They've got 14 in the standard because in other parts of Australia, like the tropic areas, then that is actually their, moisture, their equilibrium moisture content will be about 13. So the producers there are looking to, to, to supply things at a different level. This doesn't mean that that's the good, a good level for you. You don't want 10 to 14 in one job because some will shrink much more than others. Okay. Um, so we've got, had performance requirements. We've then had um, material characteristics and... I've highlighted the problem with moisture content again. So if we look now at the product suite we've got, um, the first of our products is sawn and moulded board. So we can have it in hardwoods or softwoods. We can have boards like this that are rough sawn that we can then just put on a wall. And you might think, oh, that sounds crazy, but I'll show you a couple of jobs later where that's, that's the highlight. Um, or we can mould it up into particular shapes. And working with wood is a reductive process. You start with something big and you make smaller bits out of it. You take a bigger log and you saw it up into boards. You take a bigger board, you, you route it out, you 
you mould it and you make then a shape. You might stick more bits back on, but you know, you've reduced those out of a bigger piece too. There's then a whole lot of sheet materials that we can use. So we've got plywood, so there's plywood up there. We've got oriented strand board. We've got medium density fibre board, or we've got high density fibre board. So high density fibre board is what you might what you'd call um, masonite is high density fibre board. Um, there's different ways you make each of them, and they have different versatilities depending upon how you want to use them. There's then also veneer. So veneer, basically all these panels here are all a veneer that's been sliced off a flitch um, and then applied onto a board, stuck onto a board. So when veneer is manufactured, you get a big piece of wood about yay big, usually, and um, a nice piece. You put it in, in water at about 80 degrees and you leave it there for a day or two so that the whole piece gets up to about that temperature and then you put it in the equivalent of a large food slicer. So you pass the wood across a blade with pressure and it slices off a leaf of veneer. And then you collect those leaves, you put them through a dryer and you collect them back in the same order and they form what's called a bundle and that's what bundles of veneer look like. So there's two veneer manufacturers in the state. There's quite a number of them in Australia. Well, actually, there's not that many anymore. Um, but there is, we've got one at Somerset, there's Britain's, two that makes veneers, and there's one or two producers in the north. So those pieces then, are, you can trim the edges, put them next to each other, glue them up, and form what's called a lay-on. And this is a lay-on. So that strip there might have been the width of the original veneer before it was all stuck together to form this sheet which is about 1250 by 2450. That's then stuck on a board and trimmed and then you buy it and you start to use, you start to make these things out of it. And this might be on MDF, it might be on plywood, it might be on fiberboard, a whole range of products might be the substrate for this veneer. So this is a, a, an option too. Okay, I've put this one in basically to espouse an appreciation of natural feature. Um, if you're a nice lazy architect or a designer, then the default position is you say select. I want select, please, you know, because um, it's like buying an IBM. The old days was as you bought computers, no one ever got sacked for buying IBMs. All right, so no one ever got sacked for buying, for specifying select. Um, it tends to be a wasted opportunity. This bit of serendipity here in this piece is actually not going to, you're not going to get from saying I want to select, select wood. These bits here are bits of veneer that have been laid onto a board and the veneer has got a, a feature in it. That feature is called uh, black speck. Black speck is um, a bug which eats through the wood and it eats through in a particular direction to the growth rings. And when you slice it, you can then get this repetitive black pattern from where the bugs have gone through. So each of that, there's a, 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 that hole there is the same as this hole. It's just a little bit further in from the tree. It's the same as that hole. So the veneer has been sliced off, it's been stacked, and then it's been laid next to each other to line the holes up neatly. So all of that is actually veneered board. Okay, so we've got the base timber, but then there's certain things we can do to it to change its appearance or its performance or to protect the surfaces. So we, first of all, first thing we can do, we can coat it. And we can coat it with an opaque finish, something that's coloured, um, we can use a pigment or a stain. So the pigment may be just in the coating itself and not go into the wood. 
or it could be a stain that goes into the wood as well. Or we can make it transparent, which just gives us then a clearer surface. We can impregnate the material with a preservative. So we can um, use various medium, we can use um, light organic solvents, or we can use water, and we put the timber in a, a, a chamber, we can suck a vacuum out of, that, out of the chamber, we can introduce the material, and that is absorbed then into the wood, we can pressurise it to get the preservatives into the wood to stay there. So that's, that's something we can do. The next is we can change the wood chemically. So if you take that cha same chamber and you put particular chemicals in there, is you can actually change the molecular change, you cause a chemical change in the cellulose. Now, what that does then is it means it stops being wood anymore, simply wood, and it starts being something that's a little bit different. And when it's a bit different, all the bugs that were used to eating the wood can't eat it anymore. And so you get something that has a much higher uh, durability than what you started with. So we can, I'll tell you what, I'll show you one of those jobs in a minute. The next is you can heat it up. And when you heat it up, you induce a level of what's called pyrolysis in the wood, which means is that you drive out of the wood certain volatile chemicals and that wood changes colour and it changes chemical composition. And what that does is it, it, cha it, makes the, it changes the colour of the material. That's, we might do that for appearance. It also makes it less tasty to bugs, so it actually will make it more durable. But it also reduces the strength of the material quite considerably. So most heat treatment will reduce the strength of a board by about 30%, 30 to 40%. So if someone tries to sell you heat-treated decking, say, thank you very much, but I don't want any of that, okay? Without getting the test certificates. The last thing is that we can densify the wood. We can actually take the wood, we can put it in some form of condition which softens it, and we can put it through some big platens and we crush it. And by crushing it, we increase its density. If we increase its density, we increase its fire resistance, we increase its durability, and we change its appearance. So all of those things are being used currently with um, different materials um, in this state and around Australia. So all of these things you could actually buy from suppliers. So I'll show you what some of them look like. Okay, so here's a project in Queensland it's an extension to a Queenslander house. So the front part of the house is, you know, up on stilts and slatted fronts. Um, so this is the extension they've put on. We've got, um, the whole thing has been painted. So you've got an opaque finish, timber surfaces with an opaque finish across the whole thing. So that's outside and this is inside. So inside, they've sought to mimic or reproduce the normal internal lining that you would have got in a Queenslander when people line their buildings with the insides with masonite and that sort of product. So when you did use those, they didn't use these fancy architectural gap things. They would put them on the wall, they would nail them up, and they would nail a batten over the top. And you'd put a batten all the way around the joints. So there you can see the battens being used as the detail in between the sheets. Now part of the reason you did that was that you never built those days with dry timber. All the timber you used was unseasoned, and so everything would move around, and if you didn't batten it off, things would start to pop out. So the batten was then was used to cover lots of sins. Here the timber's probably all nice and straight and clean and dry, and so the battening then is just imit imitating the details that you would have used from the 1930s, 40s. But it's been painted. Now, okay, if we look at durability point of view, if you've painted something this colour and you've used a reasonable quality paint, 
in this town, that's going to last you about 14 years on the north, maybe longer in the other. If you used a dark colour, a purple or a dark brown, it's likely to last you 10, maybe 9, 8. Colour makes a big difference in durability in terms of paint systems. Um, if you measured the temperature on one of these with a temperature gauge, the white would be, you know, in the sun might be 20, maybe 30, 40 degrees. If we had, if we measured the temperature on a black one or a dark purple one, the temperature of the surface would be up to 65. And it's that temperature difference that makes, that affects the durability of the surface. So white, it will last reasonably well. Okay. So here's a job in England and here I'm saying that this is probably pigmented coating. So effectively the timber's been put on, you've got a coating that's got a pigment in it and that's been applied and it's like a dark varnish. Now it might have been applied to the boards before they went on, the boards might have been heat treated. It was very hard to tell from the, the background of the story. But you can see that this bit obviously isn't treated. It's a, got a, just a clear or an opaque finish on it and they're playing off the, the dark colour and the light colour. Now the Europeans, they don't have dark coloured timbers normally. Or almost all of their material is light coloured light softwoods. And so if they want a dark colour, they've got to colour it. This job is made of what of a, a proprietary product called a coya, A double C O Y A. It's a trade name. It's a trade name. So the system was actually invented in CSIRO. You actually take wood, you prepare it in a particular way, and you you use acetylene to change the chemical composition of the material, the cellulose. So the the I don't I'm not a chemist, so the the Acetylene replaces certain OH bonds in the cellulose itself for a certain density of the material and it has two effects. It makes it untasty for bugs that have evolved to eat the, the wood and it also acts as a bulking agent so the, the, the wood stays firmer, it looks firmer, it doesn't um, twist and distort and weather the same way as that uh, a normal pine wood, say a, a treated pine wood. So these are all Akoya treated material. I'm saying they're Akoya, they could be some other brand. There's a number of proprietary brands doing variations on the same thing. And all of that's then been treated. The Europeans are using it quite, quite a big way in bridges. So they'll treat the whole, all the glue lamb sections before they, the materials sections before they're glue lamb. And so you end up with this, um, appearance, this view, and, and it, will, it will last without you having to paint it. Okay, so this is what heat treatment does. So here's a bit of pine prior to treatment. That's what it looks like after you treat it to about 210 degrees. You can treat it to different temperature levels and you can treat it for different periods of time, which will change the colour more or less and it changes the strength, always less, but it changes then the durability too. Now, we've got one problem as designers in Australia of claiming durability, is that the way we work out durability is by tests that usually take about 40 years. I'll explain to them when we get to durability classes. So you're waiting 40 years to get the test results. Um, and you've also got to use sites all over Australia and it gives you a durability class. The people who make heat treated material are not going to go wait in 40 years. All right? So they, they will do accelerated testing in European conditions and they will say it lasts twice as long as normal stuff. But you don't have necessarily a durability class under an Australian standard you can pin it back to. So this is a problem with innovation is that innovation usually goes much faster than our standards do. And so that leaves we, us designers who want to specify something and guarantee a client of a particular result, 
of what's likely to happen. Uh, I don't have an answer for that. It's a, that's, this is a persistent question. Okay, so this is one particular form of heat treatment. So this is actually charcoaling the surface. So with this, you actually put the board under what is a big heat platen, like a big radiator, and depending on the, the speed that you pass it under the radiator is that the top surface will char. You don't burn it, like it doesn't come out on fire, but it chars quite significantly, like you see over there. You then, often this is used in concert with a, a coating system, which then you apply, which then seals the char to the board, and you don't, it doesn't make your hand black when you rub it. Um, this has actually been used in quite a number of jobs in Australia. Um, there is at least one major Tasmanian producer who does this interstate. They don't do it here, per se, um, but they've got a charring line in Melbourne, I think, and they will, can advise you on how you can actually do this if you want. Again, you're doing it for two reasons. You're doing it for an appearance reason. You're also doing it for a durability reason, but you can't necessarily quantify the durability improvement because we don't have the standards for it and that sort of thing. Okay, any questions? Or is that, is that all right? Yep. Okay, so let's look at some options and examples. Um, basically, there's lots of different ways of applying a board to a wall or to a ceiling. We can make different profiles. We can space them apart. We can run them up and down. We can back them with certain things. We can use sheet material. We can express the joints. We can put battens on. There are lots and lots of different options. So let's just look at a couple of them. Here's ceiling lining. It's pretty, pretty straightforward. Here we've got um, Taz Oak board um, with a V lining, a VJ lining. It's applied to a ceiling in a large building. The suffete of a of a, a large open building. Here we've got the boards in a house where everything downstairs is pretty well white and but you've got a, a, a timber ceiling then running over the top. Here's another job. Um, this is from um, Pete Walker's um, practice. Um, this is a, a resort up in Lake St. Clair. And the boards here are just Taz Oak boards taken off the rack after they've been dried. They've come out of the kiln. They haven't been molded at all. And you can see the marks of production on the board. So all of these strips across here, you see the vertical, the horizontal marks, they're called a sticker mark. And that's where the boards are set one on top of the other as they dry and they make a little indentation in the wood or a little discoloration. And then usually when they're put through a moulder, that all that comes off. So normally you wouldn't see it. But here the architects wanted to have it. So they just brought the boards in and fixed them to the wall. Here's a different thing. This has been moulded a lot. So in both these jobs, they're both from a particular producer who's taken boards and routed, moulded large shapes into them. So the boards themselves would have started out as something like a 32, and they've had significant portions of that 32 moulded off. So this detail here is actually a board that goes up and then down and has a, a tongue and groove, and you can slot them in. And it's then been coloured, done with a coloured stain and, and sealed, this over here is the same stock material that was used in that, but these have then been profiled in a different format to give curves, again, so that they just slot together, and they're picking up the colour from the surrounding surfaces. So this is sort of the luxuriant layout in the, in the resort sort of place. This is a much more playful, light and entertaining sort of place. But they're all vertical boards. 
you could with this one have just put a plywood across the wall and stained it and then stained battens and put the battens on at particular spacings to give you a very, very similar outcome. This is a job at uh, Freycinet from Liminal. Um, here we've got Taz oak plywood on the floors and also the ceiling of the project. Um, so the, for any of you who are interested, the manufacturer is here tonight. So if you want to see, have a chat to them after the, or during the break or after the, the seminar, they'll be, they'll be around out the front. Um, so this material is available locally produced. It's been coloured, obviously. This is blackwood through here. That's veneer on board. And then we've got Taz oak, which has been coloured to match the blackwood. So there it's been put on with short boards spaced off, spaced in, then to give you an uneven surface and to create a visual interest. Um, here's the Sapphire Resort. Um, now, with Sapphire, this is a very large room with a, with a big curved ceiling, all of which is lined then in celery top pine. And there's probably two years of state production of celery top pine in that ceiling. Maybe not two years, maybe it's only a year. But, you know, there's a lot of celery top that's gone in there. Um, this is Taz Oak here, and that's then been stained, coloured, to sort of match, not to match the celery top, but to blend with it, because otherwise it would have created a contrast between the pale browns and pinks of the Taz Oak. It's been coloured to match up with the, with the celery top. And again, here we've got Taz Oak in veneer, and that's been coloured slightly differently to accent the, the shelving. So we've got a combination of solid board, different species, different spacings, um, accent on the gaps, and we've got different colours being used in the, in the surface treatments. Here's a wardle job from Bruny Island, where it's basically an imitation of a packing case approach. So packing cases, you've only got timbers of certain length, and if you look in certain of the older buildings, then you've, you've got your studs and then the, the lining is basically the packing cases, the bits you could recover from the packing cases stuck to the wall. And this is sort of a formalisation of that because the, the, the boards are a particular length, but they're of different widths, like you've had to pull them apart from various places. I don't think they had to do that, but... Pardon? They may well have. I haven't had discussed it. I've just, I'm just looking at the photographs and seeing how the, de the details work. So also here we can see that we're actually using the studs as actually part of the composition. And that's actually reasonably common if you pick good studs, treat them nicely, join them correctly, and space them regularly there's no reason why they actually can't be your whole system um, when they're lined on one side rather than trying to line them on two. This is a, a job in, this is a seven or eight year old, old job now, this is a job where we've got blackwood, it's blackwood veneer in these two photographs. The veneer is what's called un or mismatched veneer, so you don't try and book it or, or keep it in sequence, you get veneer from different, different um, bundles, you put it together, and so you get a much more irregular pattern in your, in your, um, your sheet. And then that sheet is then applied onto a wall frame and fixed. Now with this job, they wanted to use so much blackwood is that they were told that if they wanted, they get the, the architects gave the producers a colour spec and then the producers said, fine, come back in two years and I'll have it ready. 
because the colour spec took out about 40% of production and didn't use a whole range of their material which was fall, too dark or too light. The architects quite sensibly then decided that they could come up with three colour specifications. The producers could bundle their material by that specification, supply it to the architects and to the builders, and the builders design, sorry, the architects designed that different rooms would have different colour batches. And they also then worked out that they would make sure that no one could see contrasting colour batches from any one point. So as you go up the building, the colour of the blackwood in the various sections of the building vary, but no one notices. Okay, here's a, a Suchbury house. Now, this is, I mean, it's pretty strong um, in this one. So actually, if we look at this big blade that runs down there, I suspect that might be something like an LVL, a deep LVL section, which has then had a veneer face put to it. You can see how the pattern in the veneer repeats, and that is what you get when you book the veneer out of the bundle. You can see it certainly in this wall here. These boards here running vertically, um, they're a solid board and you can see that obviously they don't match each other, but those other ones up there do. You get a much stronger rhythm. Now I suspect maybe that they've put the veneer up high and they've put the solid wood down where it might be bumped or whatever because the veneer does can be um, subject to some, some damage over time. Um, but it's just a, a combination veneer and board job in very, very striking combinations. Here's something that's a little bit more sedate. This is a, a, a blackwood job where you've got blades here that separate a stairwell and a, a sitting area and you've got veneered board here dressing a column, you've got a blackwood floor and you've got blackwood veneered panels there at the back. So there's lots of different ways, if we look at this, there's lots of different ways you can use lots of different species internally. Um, you don't have to worry about durability considerations so much. It's really a combination of the colours that you're after and using then ply, veneer and solid board to then to make up the combinations that you want. Some people do have, have really strong tastes and like to have strong colours and colour texturing, and other people like things that are much more subtle, which is fine because there's lots of us. We can, we can pick the one that we're after. Okay, so uh, any quick questions? If not, um, how about we take a, a five minute break, and see if there's a glass of cold water outside, and um, there's a biscuit at least. Uh, All right, we'll continue. If we look at cladding as opposed to lining, um, we've got to worry about things like durability, fire resistance and stability. I'm not, as I said, I'm not going to touch fire resistance so much. It's all to do with density. It's all to do with um, where, what levels you're exposed to. So if you want to design something for a timber structure externally or something that's exposed externally, your basic four basic steps are to assess the hazard conditions of the location, match the timber and the connections with the hazard for the required service life. So if you only want it to last five years, it's quite easy. There's, you, know, you can do lots of things you want to do. If you want to make, get it to last 40 years, there's particular things you're also keen to do. So we've got to design for the performance and detail to minimise the hazard. So just because you're near the seaside doesn't necessarily mean the thing you're putting in has to be fully exposed to the surf all the time. There are various things you can do to moderate that. And then you want to maintain the material. Now, if we're looking at cladding, really we're in this condition. So this is hazard classes, 
hazard classes run from class one to class six. And this deals with the performance requirement that you, you're setting. So the situation we want, to, want the things to perform in is hazard class three, which is outside above ground. It's exposed to wetting and leaching. And you've got decay borers and termites as your biological hazards. Um, it's also weathering is another one. So weatherings can be an important consideration in, in how it will, will look. Um, H1 to 2 are basically inside. H4 and 5 are in the ground in various locations. And H6 is in the water. So if we take a diagram of that, if, this is, if we have a look at this building, then up in that roof space or in these, any of these rooms is H1 where you might get moisture conditions like around a bathroom or in the envelope would be H2. Where it's exposed to the weather is going to be H3. And generally you take the eave at a 30 degree angle down to give you depth defining what's H3. So back in here is H2. Um, so this is H3, but this is H4. So the location of where we're putting things is going to make a big impact. Even if it's H3, it might be H3 here, behind um, another building, out of the weather, out of the sunlight. And so that's obviously in a less exposed condition than something in the sunlight with, with water hitting it regularly. And obviously, if something's in Hobart, it's under different conditions than if it's in Alice Springs than if it's in Townsville. Okay, so as soon as we move north, our humidity levels go up, our sun exposure goes up, our temperatures go up. So the location in the building, the orientation of the building, where the cladding is, will all impact the performance that we're likely to get. So in, this, in our climate, it's things to the north that are actually going to be um, most impacted by weathering and solar effects and things on the south face which are then impacted more by moisture and decay. That's just the nature of, of, of how our winters run here. So we want to match the timber and the connections with the hazard. So if we want to match the timber, um, we've got two options. We've got to use a durable heartwood we want to treat the sapwood if we, if we can or if we want to. And then we want to select durable connections and connectors. So with heartwood, there is a durability rating that applies to most species. Um, now the durability rating comes from these 40 years of tests around sites around Australia and people going out and digging them out of the ground every two years and scraping them with pen knives. I mean, that might sound odd, but that's exactly what they did, um, to see how far they got chewed away in different sites and then balanced off across sites. So species then fall into these categories of one to four, four being pretty awful, five being a more reason sorry, three being more reasonable, two being very useful, one being very durable. Now, things fall at the top or the bottom of those scales. So while they're boundaries, there's also a linear effect. So if you look at something like um, celery top, celery top is a low end of a two. So it performs better than a three, but it doesn't perform as well as some of the, the better twos. Um, our messmate, which is obliqua, which is about 60% of our Tasmanian oak, is actually a three but the other two are a four, and they will last quite differently in conditions. Now, it, this only applies to sap to heartwood. Heartwood's that bit of the tree that's inside the sapwood band. Now, the sapwood band is, it doesn't have protective extractives put into the wood, and it's used for moving sugars up and down, and water up and down the tree between the roots and the leaves. So because it's full of starch, it doesn't have these extractives and all the, the, the cells are actually connected up, then 
it's really tasty for bugs. So if you have a durability class 1 species, the sapwood of that species will still be durability class 4. So if you take a board and it's got a sapwood edge, the heartwood part might last you 40 years, but the sapwood might rot off in 3 or 4. So that's a major consideration. For most hardwood producers, they cut the sapwood off, most of the cases. Now, you can treat the material to, to a particular level. And the levels that you treat it to are called treatment classes, and the, they use exactly the same term as the hazard classes. So they're actually different scales, but they're the same term. It makes life really easy. OK, so a H3 treatment is suitable for a H3 application. A H4 treatment is suitable for a H4 application. If you buy a piece of pine and it's green, it may only be treated for H2, and if you put it in the ground, it will last five years. Just because it's treated doesn't mean it's treated to a sufficient level for a high application. The treatment level is determined by the amount of preservative that gets into the wood and its retention in the wood. So if you treat it and you get lots of chemical in there, it will last a lot longer than um, otherwise. So if you take, I mean, I do it at home. I've done this. So um, if you get a bit of decking, which is treated for H3, and you use it to edge your garden, then it'll last about eight years. Right? More than if it's not treated at all, but it's not going to last the same as if it's on a deck with air all the way around it. Yeah? So it, will, it still, will still decay. And so you only can treat the, the sapwood. So that's still the same for pine. The centre part of the pine will not treat. So it won't, it, the treatments won't get in as reliably. In hardwood, they don't get in at all. In pine, they don't get in as well as they should. I, I haven't got the bit of wood in the car to show you, but anyway. Now, I bring that up basically because that's another something else that we're always having to deal with in questions. So we want to design for compliant and robust performance. Being very, very subtle with cladding materials is often something that you, you don't necessarily want. You want to detail to reduce the impact of moisture. So you want to get moisture out of there. That's a mo the moisture performance is quite critical. You've got to understand what the impact of sunshine is going to be. And you want to protect from termites, which down here we don't have to do. But we do have to cope with those other ones. And if we want to detail for water exclusion, we want to keep the timber dry if we can. I'm a big advocate for eaves. We want to exclude or shed water. So we want surfaces that will let water run off and not capture them and not hold them on. And then we want to ensure the wood can dry out if it gets wet. So I'll have a look at a series of projects and some details. So this is a weatherboarded wall. These are both weatherboard walls. This one's in Europe and that one's in Victoria. So that's a high school. Um, in both of these cases, you've got a, a, a stud frame wall, which has then got a, a wrap around it. You've got a batten off the stud frame, and then the cladding's put on, so that you have an air gap in between the cladding and the wall frame. So any moisture gets through will run down the back, and you've got an air space for the whole thing to dry out. Now, also, you'll see that you've got a whole range of flashings. So you've got these sheet metal flashings here, which are to take the water off the bottom of the board. There's an air gap there to allow air to circulate back up behind. And then drip it off the front. You've got those similar on the top. You've got another one up there where you've got a change of species. One board comes down and then goes over the top of the other one. Now they've got it. They've got to change the species. You can see different, different colours that they're different. But also is that wood is like straws and 
If you put water on the outside of a straw, it will run off. If you pour it on the top of the straw, some will go down in the middle of the straw. So you've got to make sure that you protect the end of the wood as much as possible to stop the moisture getting in. So you can paint it or do some other sorts of surface. In this case, they've put a flashing out across, the, across the top of the board and back down the face a little bit to stop any moisture going down onto the top surface and getting it back out on the, on the face where it can run straight off. And then you also want to make sure you're flashing above and below windows. So you want corrosion resistance fixings. There's a number of cases, anyone who walks around Battery Point can see all of these lovely fences that people have put up and they've just used straight build X screws and two years afterwards, there's all these beautiful rust marks coming through the paint, yeah? Everyone see them? Yep. So, and they will have used treated pine to do it before they've painted it, thinking that that'll last a long time. And of course, the copper in the treatment is chewing away the surface of the material, chewing away the finish, which is then causing the paint to come off, the water to get in, and of course, you've made a little battery and that fixing is going to last maybe four years before that whole fence has got to be replaced. Okay, so that's bad selection. So this is out of Design Guide 5. It tells you the sort of fixings that you should, protection levels that you should use, and the sort of locations you want to use them in. Um, if you use the software, it'll actually tell you exactly how long you're expected to, you'll expect each of these to last in particular locations. If we look at some options and examples, there are lots of different ways in which we can clad a wall. I want to point out this one, because it becomes it's become quite fashionable, um, is that here you've got a wall frame, you've got a, a layer there that could be just a building wrap, but could also actually be a fibre cement sheet. And you've then got a batten, and then you've got boards on the face. Now, this one's become is very fashionable now. Um, also, we can have sheet material, and we can we can put a flashing or, and a cover strip, or we can leave the cover strips off and expose the flashing. There's also lots of different ways in which we can butt boards together. We can have a board, and we can run it into a batten, butt it in solidly even rebate it in. Um, like over here, we can mitre them and join them together. We can lap them one over the other. There's all these different ways in which it can be done. Now, these might look quite traditional draw drawings, because they are, but we can have a look at some projects where these things have been done. So, okay, this is a job where the external cladding is unfinished uh, Taz oak board. So it has no coating on it. They have not been um, pro uh, profiled at all. You can see where the sticker marks are. You know, the little shiny bits running across. So they've just been pulled off the rack, probably might have been cleaned up, and then just fixed to the wall. They're fixed in such a way that there's an air space in behind them. There's a, a cavity, a, a, sh a sheet metal cap on the top, which you can see, and there's a gap at the bottom, and there's a flashing to let the water run out. Ideally, you would like to try and avoid this bit. This bit's fine, but this bit here, if you go back, this is at Mona, of course, if you go out to Mona and you walk along here now, four or five years after this photo was taken, I can guarantee that those bits are all dirty and you might even start to get a little bit of K in that bit, but this bit will be just fine. Because there is a splash zone up from a surface, and it's about 150 millimetres. So water will hit a surface, it will splash up, it will take dirt with it, the dirt will adhere to the wood, that will hold the moisture and also encourage bacteria to grow. So if you keep it up that distance, off the surrounding, off that hard surface, you'll get a much, much longer service life out of the whole board. Okay, here's a project from Germany. 
And this is one of those jobs where um, you have this horizontal battening. Now this one's been detailed in a particular way, and I'm going to, it's, I'll compare this to the next one we'll show you, is that in this job they've made a structural wall, they've put a fibre cement, I assume it's fibre cement, I couldn't get in there to have a close look, fibre cement cladding. So effectively they've got a fully enclosed building. Then they've actually made a frame of these battened walls in a workshop. So each of those battens is actually a section that's, that's pitched like this. It has a bevel on this edge and a bevel on that and the edge is rounded. Because it's rounded, water doesn't collect on that edge. It just runs straight around and it drips straight off the bottom. It slopes down. You can see that they've got a pitch and they're fixed from the back to a vertical support. You can just see it in there. You can see it in that one side also. So that would have come as a panel and then been fixed into the wall at the back. So there's no fixing at the front. All of these pitch and they've all got a rounded edge. So it does discolour but the water just runs straight off the thing. So you can get quite a, a a nice appearance out of it for quite a long time. Here's a job from the States and I guarantee you this was photographed about a month after they'd finished it. Okay? And if you look at this detail here, the sections are rounded, that's fine, but they're flat. They're just screwed in and they're screwed onto a panel. Now you're going to retain a lot of moisture in there. Especially in between these trees, you're going to get leaves hitting it and get caught. And so this is going to discolour quite significantly over time. But it takes a great photograph in the first month. Okay, so there is a lot of uh, uh, architecturally award-winning jobs which look great for the first year and a half and then after that look bloody awful. Um, and this is likely to be one of them. If we were detailing this, if we were reconsidering the detail, then if these had a pitch on them, they were screwed to another batten and they were then as a panel fixed onto the wall and I knew that I could get airflow down the back, then it would probably increase the service life of the wall by about a factor of five compared to how long this is going to last. Okay, so here's... Um, these are just some, some European domestic jobs. This is plywood and the plywood's got a coating on it and it's been painted and it's fixed. Um, it has a tongue and groove so they overlap. Um, they've been coloured the same way as in Australia we'd use fibre cement for, for something like this. But these are plywood with a weatherboard sat on the top. This is an interesting detail where a sheet of plywood is actually used like a big weatherboard. So at the bottom, a batten's put on the wall and then the plywood's put on so it's got an angle, so it's fixed to the wall. Then you put another batten at the top of the plywood, like on the plywood, to pack it out and then you put another one in so you get a sloping effect. So as you can see, it's just plywood and it's been coloured. So because you've done that, you can actually get a reasonable lip. You're not using solid wood. Um, and it does give you quite a nice effect. I'll show you another one which is using that same general approach but much more dramatically in a minute. So here's another plywood job. This is in Queensland where you've got this large, I think it's about a six-story, um, multi-story, six-story building and you've got shading devices here, large shading shape, which has been put on and clad in plywood. And that's the detail of it there. And it looks a lot like a, a Carter Hold Harvey shadow clad product to me. Um, it's fixed in. It's got then an, a pigmented coating, which has gone over the top. And it all be pine and it would all have be treated. Here's this one I was talking about where you use the same detail as the one we, we 
discussing of the plywood and the batten, where you're actually making these large panels like a big shingle. And I can't tell you whether that's been charcoal treated or whether it's coated to give you the, the dark colour, but you can see then how the battens have been used with the plywood set in to give you this large facade. And of course, if you do it with a, a house builder, the, the, the shingles and the windows don't match up. If you use an architect, they get everything to line up nicely in it. Um, you get a much more sympathetic overall solution. That's just a plug for the profession. But you can see, obviously, that that's just a plywood sheet yeah, from the grain surfaces. And inside this project, and they've used veneered board as basically a dado, a lower dadoed section, um, to run the same species as the floor up the walls to give them an, a, a, um, an enclosed internal section. Here's a, a little job in Victoria where they've made these housing modules these little micro houses um, that all connect together to form a bigger job and they've, they've used shingles. So shingles are becoming fashionable again in certain circles. So here's your shingle cladding. Um, they're set, I'm happy to explain shingling to someone but not tonight. Um, but if we look in here, this dark colours around the top is probably actually a heat treated material. And here the heat treatment is to change the colour. It's to give you a richer colour with probably a cheaper material. Of course, a lot of the dark timbers can actually be really expensive. So if you heat treat it, you can give you yourself a different um, colour texture to work to. I put this one in when we put the shingles in. I was a, had the pleasure of going to a, a German um, prefabricated building manufacturer in, in near Munich, and they're the name of Balfritz. Balfritz. So Balfritz has been in business since 1890 something, making prefabricated buildings. They now make really expensive high end houses, all in their factory in Munich and they, or outside Munich and they ship them around the country. But this, they were using split oak tiles as a cladding. Now, I wondered, I was wondering at the time how they did it, but then I realised they've basically used exactly the same detail that you'd use with stone. So if you were doing this as a stonework wall, you would actually have a tile, you'd have holes in the top and the bottom, and then you would put a, a fixing rail with a pins and you'd put the, the, the piece on the pins. You would then put the next layer in and you'd have a bracket. And that bracket would be fixed to the wall and there'd be two, still two pins sticking up. So you'd do a whole long line, you'd have a line of pins, you'd come along with the next line and you'd offset one distance. So you've got a, a stretcher bond. And then you'd build up your wall that way. Um, this had a big eave, so I don't know how long it's going to last, but it was really interesting when you looked at it. It has to get behind it, but it'll have to drain out. And of course, you, you've got all these little ledges and everything, so if this was a highly dusty environment, you'd get a lot of dirt on there really quickly too. But anyway, they're selling the high-end markets, you know, they're not worried about <laughs> some of these things. They're not worried about a low-cost option, these boys. If you saw their bathroom showroom, you'd understand. Okay, so weathering, eaves and coatings. This is uh, important considerations when we're looking at cladding. Okay, so here's a house over here. It's plywood clad. It's got a big eave. It's painted. That's a much, much low, more low, stable, it's not going to change that much, low maintenance option than this one. Um, these people knew what they were doing, but and it's happened, and they're quite they're quite happy. But 
This one, that Eve, will reduce the problems that that wall's going to have by a factor of about uh, 300%. You know, it will drop them down to by into a third of what they would otherwise be. There's lots of research that show an Eve of 600 reduces the problems you have with the facade by about 80%. All right, so and eaves, eaves are good things. In this job, you've got a lot at large eave. You've got a large beam that comes out. The large beam is coated by, by a plastic and by paint at this end to protect from end grain. But of course, the water hits the surface and you do get weathering here. You also get this dark stain. And what, of course, what happens is the wood gets wet extractives in the wood are mobilised because it's wet and they concentrate there where the water runs to, which is that dark line. And obviously this bit fades and that fading varies depending upon the exposure. But these people have designed for that and they're quite happy that it's changing colour. Here's that problem I told you about, about the lack of robust cladding. So this is in a major Tasmanian project and it's, I think it's black butt cladding and you can't see any fixings and I think that's one of the problems is that it's, it's shiplapped and instead of fixing it at regular intervals, it's been secret nailed. And of course, all that's done is it's got, there's nothing constraining the board, it's in the sun, it gets wet, it's in the sun, it gets wet and it's done this. Yeah? Here's a major problem with biodegradation. I suppose I shouldn't show you things that have gone bad. I should say everything's marvellous, just do it. But that's not responsible because we want the projects to last long and, and perform well. So this is a job in Brisbane. Um, won a lot of awards when it was put up. Okay, so the arrangement was they built this particular part of the building and they wanted to clad it all in wood and not put any roof or anything over it. They put a timber frame up and they put boards straight across. Now the boards are just boards, that's all they were. They, they, were, they were profile, they were square dressed, but they, there wasn't any bevels on them or anything like that. They screwed them into the frame and then when they butted up, they just sort of put the screw in sideways here and sideways there, and there wasn't a lot of room for them to work to. About three years after the building was built, you get quite a lot of discoloration in the surface. Five years afterwards, the whole thing starts to go mouldy. Um, I was told by the people who work in Timber Queensland, who we deal with quite regularly, is that this species goes mouldy if you leave it outside. North of from Brisbane North, right? Because the, you get humidity conditions up there which are different to what we get, and so the particular species is just reacting in a, a way that the moisture conditions dictate. You would think, I would have thought, I did think when I first saw the building that oh, this is great, you know, there's plenty of airflow, it'll dry out, all this sort of stuff. The fellow from Timber Queens has said, no, nah, no, nah, that stuff, it's it'll it's going to do this. And five years later, he was right. You know, there it is. And it was a, it's a significant problem. Um, I don't know what the solution has been. That photograph's about five years old. So this photograph's about four or five years old. So it's a 10-year-old building. Um, other parts are clad in wood and they're under a big eave and they've probably performed really nicely. And this bit hasn't. Okay, this is the craziest bit of... Oh, a great photograph. You walk, you go into some buildings, you go, this is a beautiful thing, I'll photograph that. Or you walk in, you say, this is such a nice mess. I've got to photograph that because this is going to be a class. Okay, so this is a project in Germany. Um, it was a really lovely school, which in most of the cases was great, except where you actually came into the major entranceway. And in that, they actually brought the ground up right up to near the timber and then where you went inside there was a glass roof that extended out past the door. So then what you have 
is you've got a bit of the roof, a bit of the wall, which is exposed to the weather on a regular basis, and therefore it's changed colour, which generally is not a problem. In here, you've got something that has no water go onto it at all, and so it's just darkened. Also not a problem. The problem is, is when you try and combine the two and you don't have a line to demarcate. With the glass roof, the glass roof, and I don't know why they did this, the glass roof pitched to the front. So that not only did you have to walk through a fountain, uh, sort of a shower, as you got into the building, is that it dribbled down the walls. Which then gives you this great green, cut, green effect as the, the water's continually running down that wall and it can't really run off. The next is, is that it's close to the ground and you get splashing up off the ground onto this zone. Now the thing is, if you'd brought it up the 150 or 200, you don't have any of that problem because the splashes don't go up that high. I mean, you really need, do need to, to scale it for the location. So in Tassie, you know, 150 is probably enough. In Brisbane, where you, or, or Suva, or where you actually get these really torrential drown pours, you probably want to take it up a bit further. But if you walk around and see people's fences and see where the black bit stops, that's how high you want to take it up. I mean, it's, it's observation. Okay, so there's a lot of things that are in this list that we've actually spoken about tonight. And because these are the problems you want to avoid if you detail properly. If you detail properly, you can avoid almost all of them. If you don't detail properly, you can get them all to work badly in one spot. And... People will, your clients will be less happy with you than probably when you started. Okay, so on that happy note, um, I'd just like to wrap up and, and say if you're using material inside, durability is not that much of an issue. You've got a whole range of products. You're after colour, variation, etc. When you use them, when you're outside, you've got durability issues. You've got water. You've got splashing. You've got um, fire that you've got to consider and you want to detail things properly. With wood, you've either got to keep it dry or you've got to let it dry out. Two major rules. You know, keep it out. Don't let it get wet or let it dry out if, you, if it's going to get wet. If you're going to put it in a spot where it's going to be regularly wet, treat it to blazes. Protect it with something. Now, if you go around lots of Hobart, North Hobart, South Hobart, you'll actually see buildings that are made of durability class 4 material, Taz Oak, that have been there since 1890 and they've all been painted. Yeah, The outsides are painted and the things that, have, that might have broken down are the window frames because you've got a flat ledge. But the weatherboards have been painted. You know, we can go up to Battery Point and we can walk around and we can see all these buildings that have lasted that long. So it's not like we don't know how to do it or that we haven't known how to do it for a long time. If we don't want to coat them, we've got to look at either ways in which we can treat it or detailing it so that we know how long it's likely to last and we can plan to replace things. Right? Because if we know it's going to only last 30 years, we want to just detail it so that we can actually take it off after that period of time and replace it with a new one, which can be quite legitimate. Okay, so this is just a fine little happy snap of this is part of the railway sheds at Lonnie that have probably been there since about 1890 and been in service. So it, it can work. And I'm open for questions. God, that stopped everybody. <laughs> <laughs>